Good morning. I'm John Seth, the pastor of Blanket United Methodist Church, and thank you for joining us for this special time of worship on Sunday, the 28th of March. We're certainly living in some interesting times, and so we're being as creative as we can to continue to spread the Word of God and are doing it through this uh, Facebook recording. We tried to do it on Zoom, but we kept losing the internet connection, and so this is why we had uh, a backup. And so, uh, hat tip to our internet connector, Robert Dameron, who got us all set up electronically today. Just a few uh, things of housekeeping uh, before I bring this morning's message. Uh, there are uh, a number of prayer requests that I've heard, uh, especially Ella and Dee Leon, uh, Frida Jones in Comanche, David Young, who, as far as I know, is still in the hospital in uh, Brownwood uh, that is quite ill. We need to also remember all of the people who are serving us in so many different ways at the grocery stores, food production, and extend them uh, a warm greeting of grace and thanks when you do have the opportunity uh, and need to go shopping. The other thing, even though our church is small and uh, our budget is limited, we still have some financial need to support the ministries that we do every month, Good Samaritans and some others. So if you would like to mail in your tithes, offerings, or gift, you, you can do so by uh, using the following uh, address. At Blanket United Methodist Church, Box 65, uh, 76432 in Blanket, Texas. Thank you. This morning I want to start by reading some select scriptures uh, before the message. The first very familiar one. The, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still water. He restores my soul. He guides me in path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel, fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our next reading comes from Mark 1, verses 35 to 42. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his com companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and driving out the demons. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. And from Acts 1. <clears throat> verses 3 to 11. Luke goes on to write, After his suffering, that is, of Jesus, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave the command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you will have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the time of the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses 
in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken before their very eyes and a cloud hid him before their sight. They were looking intently up to the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy word this morning. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we are humbled by the love that you have for us. And in times in which many of us have never experienced before, we give you thanks for the reassurance and guidance and compassion and love that you have for all of us. Lord, let us be that instrument of light, instrument of grace, during this time in which there may be so many that feel this is so chaotic, but yet your plan continues to come here on earth as it is in heaven. And we give you thanks for your plan of goodness and peace and love for us all. Amen. I think we'd all agree that we're certainly experiencing some very interesting times. If you do any kind of reading or watching of news media, we see ever-increasing and dramatic steps that are affecting millions and millions of lives to limit the spread of coronavirus. And they are announced daily in countries around the world. And that's what it takes, some limitations to get to the point where we can flatten the curve, so to speak, on this virus. And we do that in an attempt to reduce the worldly effect of this pandemic. But with all of this happening, we need to remember, even if every Christian on earth were kept in their home for several months or longer, the story of Jesus, the example of his love and offer of forgiveness can never be quarantined. It will never be sheltered in place. For the story of Jesus is an unstoppable contagion that does not hurt, it heals. It does not destroy, it transforms. It does not cause death, but brings new life to all who accept and believe in his example of life and forgiveness. The Apostle Paul understood this as well. At the end of his life, being stuck in a jail cell in Rome, literally shackled to a Roman soldier waiting to be executed, he still was writing about the good news of Jesus. He wrote in his second letter to Timothy, And because I preach the good news, I am suffering, and I have been chained like a criminal. But the word of God cannot be chained. Don't you love that last phrase? The word of God cannot be changed. Even while Paul was in prison, the message was spreading and multiplying during this time in which he was literally quarantined to death. In the same way, we may feel somewhat quarantined during this time in which we are encouraged to have social distancing and house confinement for many people. But we must remember, the word of God cannot be changed. It's interesting to note that in the first century church, the story of Jesus spread from Jerusalem to Rome in less than 30 years. This without the use of cell phone, internet, Facebook, or Instagram. And the message of Christ continues to spread today. I believe we are living in a time in where the gospel can spread faster and faster than ever before. The circumstances surrounding this pandemic, I believe, can accelerate the spread of the good news of Jesus Christ. And for the first time since 9-11, the time in which I first started serving the Blanket United Methodist Church, there are many people who are turning to God. They are worried about death. They are worried about this life and the afterlife. And there are innumerable examples that we have seen in many areas on media of people sharing and serving others in some incredible and unselfish ways. In 1985, excuse me, in 1995, Hollywood produced a popular movie called Outbreak. It was starring Rene Rousseau and Dustin Hoffman. Many of you may re remember seeing this movie. This classic movie is now in the top 10 movies being viewed on Netflix during this month. 
It tells the story of how a monkey got a contagious strand of, of the Ebola virus, and this infected monkey scratches a man, and then the man goes to a movie theater and sneezes. And then the camera follows all the particles that come out of his nose and mouth into the theater, into the open mouth of an unsuspecting movie the theater watcher as he is eating popcorn. And boom, the outbreak begins. But there's a very scary scene in this movie, Outbreak, where a military epidemiologist talks about the spread of this virus. Standing in front of a large map, he says the infection will start here, and he points to a place on the map. Within hours, it will spread this far. And within 24 hours, it will spread then this far. And within 72 hours, it will spread across the whole United States. It's, it's really interesting because if you think about it, it's almost as if the writers of that movie got their idea from Scripture. For we heard earlier in the reading from Acts when Jesus told the disciples how the God would literally infect the world in a very good way. He said, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we can praise God this morning that his gospel message is more contagious than the coronavirus or any virus that may be out there. The difference is, and we know this, is that the gospel doesn't kill you. It transforms you. The story of Jesus will never make you ill. It will make you well. It doesn't lock you down, but it sets you free. We heard earlier in Mark 1 how Jesus was literally patient zero, so to speak, and starts this contagious movement that continues to spread like a holy pandemic 2,000 years later. You see, Jesus wasn't quarantined or sheltered in place. God placed Jesus and his ministry literally where its growth could be exponential. And what Christ did, we can do as well. What Jesus started, we can continue. Well, how, you may ask? Well, in three ways. We pray, we care, and we share. Jesus is our ultimate example when it comes to prayer. Many times the Gospels record Christ praying, often by himself and at other times with those for, for those who are with him and for others. We should do that. We should do that as well. We should pray for people who have, who have yet to respond to Christ's offer of forgiveness. We should pray for those people and families that are affected by Corona the coronavirus or other maladies in our hospitals at this time. We should pray for the thousands of healthcare teams across the world who are serving those who are ill. We should pray for those at the grocery stores and the dollar stores who are working to provide food and soaps and cleansers for us to purchase and to keep our family safe. The list is literally endless for those who, that you can lift up in prayer. And while you're leaving home on that trip to the grocery store, you can pray while you're driving as well. But I encourage you, keep your eyes open while you're driving. Trust me, God will understand. So after we pray, the second thing we need to do is to care. We need to care for one another. The internet, social media, and broadcast news, they are mixed blessings. Yes, there's lots of good information to be found. But there are many literal and figurative demons with which many people are wrestling due to the misinformation and scaremongering that is present. If you really look at our world, you can easily see that there are forces of darkness that are present, and they are real. And Satan is doing everything in his power to stop us from loving Jesus and from serving others through his name. 1 Peter 5 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. In the research that I did this week, I found that a roar, a lion, when a lion roars, it is at 114 decibels. It is louder than a jackhammer and almost as loud as a jet engine. And the roar from a lion can be heard literally five miles away. 
You see, Satan is roaring. He is roaring his hatred at humanity in very, very many visceral ways. Every time you read about another serial, serial killer on the loose, an aborted baby or a trafficked child, there is a demon smiling behind it all. And I can guarantee you this morning that Satan and his army of fallen angels want to leverage this pandemic to steal, to kill, and destroy. They want to steal joy. They want to kill relationships. They want to destroy lives. As many of us know, Blanket, along with many other churches, large and small, have closed. But I was shocked to read that the Planned Parenthood clinics are still open, deemed as an essential service. That's right. In many places, in many states, abortion clinics remain open, deemed as an essential service. What a sad reflection that is on our society today. Many of us have heard the phrase, boy, that guy is really wrestling with some demons. These may be habits or thoughts or baggage that a person is struggling with that can lead to loneliness, depression, alcoholism, suicide, or shattered relationships. These kinds of demons are exacerbated during this time of global crisis and pandemic. Maybe you've lost so much money in the stock market in the last several weeks that you're worried about your retirement. Maybe you've lost your job to the massive cuts in business that have happened across America. You're worried about paying the mortgage or even putting food on the table. And if you are feeling all of this stress, imagine the stress level that people have that are experiencing very similar situations that don't have Christ as their solid foundation. We must reach out to those who are hurting with the love of Jesus. As followers of Christ, empowered by him and guided by the Holy Spirit, we can share Jesus' message of love and hope to those that we sense are in need. Perhaps an encouraging word, a smile of greeting, or a word of thanks and grace will reveal to many how we care for others during this time. We need to be the voice of reason and love in a sea of chaos that surrounds us. We need to learn from history to be the instrument of light and grace. Moses Lee wrote these words for the Gospel Coalition. From about 250 A.D. to 262 A.D., Western civilization was devastated by one of the de deadliest pandemics in its history. Though the exact cause of this plague was never determined, the city of Rome was said to have lost an estimated 5,000 people a day at the height of this pandemic. One eyewitness, Bishop Dion Suvius of Alexandria, noted the difference between Christian and non-Christian responses to the plague. He said of the non-Christians in Alexandria, at the first onset of the disease, they pushed the sufferers away and fled from their dearest, literally throwing them in the roads before they were dead, treating unburied corpses as dirt, hoping thereby to avert the spread and the contagion of the fatal disease. But do what they would, they found it was difficult to escape. There are non-Christian accounts that also confirm this situation. But yet a hundred years later, the emperor Julian attempted to curb the growth of Christianity after the plague by leading a campaign to establish pagan charities that literally mirrored the work of Christians during his time of reign. In a letter of 362, Julian complained that the Hellenists needed to match the Christians in virtue, blaming the recent growth of Christianity on their benevolence to strangers, their care for the graves of the dead, and the pretended holiness of their lives. Elsewhere he wrote, For it is a disgrace that the impious Galileans support not only their own poor, but ours as well. Throughout history, Christians have set the pace by rushing in when it seems that everyone else was rushing out, and I believe we can still set the pace today. 
We can set the pace for hygiene. You know, I know it doesn't sound really super spiritual on a Sunday morning, but there's an old Civil War saying that used to go, trust God and keep your powder dry. We could put it this way. Trust God, wash your hands, keep your distance, wear a mask if you're in a crowd. As Proverbs 27 reminds us, the prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. It is no act of love to infect someone with coronavirus or to be infected. We must use the proper protocols for hygiene and safety if we are really going to love and respect those that are around us. And as I mentioned, consider wearing a mask in very crowded areas. Secondly, we need to set the pace for peace. We are living in a social media that many of us realize is driven by fear and fear mongering. We need to be the voices of calm and peace during this time. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. May we be the peacemakers during the time of rumor, frustra frustration, and anger. May we be the voices that calm people instead of stirring them up. And finally, we need to set the pace for encouragement. Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Maybe this means that we could send an encouraging text or a note to friends or people that you may know who don't yet know Jesus. You could include a couple of encouraging verses or passages in your message to them. What a great way to open the door to future gospel conversation. Jesus prayed for those who were hurting. He cared for the hurting by casting out their demons and healing the sick. We too must pray. We must care. And we must share the good news of Jesus Christ every day, often in more creative ways than we can ever imagine. We need to remember that nothing ever surprises our Father in heaven. But yet through our faith in Jesus Christ, trusting in the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we too will persevere and we will come out of this pandemic to continue to see God's plan come to this earth as he has it planned, to be able to tell people of the goodness and the hope and the grace and peace that is offered through the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. I want to thank author uh, Greg Steyer for his encouragement and ideas this morning in this message. I would encourage us all to be that instrument of peace, of grace, and light during a time in which so many people will be concerned, fearful, and not exactly sure of what we do. But we know what to do. We will pray, we will care, and we will share. Thank you.